Today we're going to be showing you some long-term survival skills, specifically how to cold smoke and cure some of your meats and foraged vegetables along the trail. Now we're going to be using this stone oven right here, and we built this several weeks ago. Very effective, very efficient. If you have any questions about how it's put together or how it works, go ahead and click the link above. In short though, the fire goes down here. This creates the heat that you need and a little bit of light. Your oven compartment's right here, and this is where you bake and cook any of your meals. We've cooked several since then. Works really well. Today we're going to be expanding the functionality of this oven though. We're going to be building a oven rack over the top, a drying rack, a cold smoking rack, in order to use the smoke that escapes from the oven whenever it's being used. We'll be able to put lots of our foodstuffs above here. The smoke will come up, cure, and actively preserve it. So we're going to show you that from start to finish, step by step. Let's go ahead and get to it. For the first stage of the build, we've got to put together a tripod. And the idea is that you're going to get three poles of fairly similar diameter and length. Make sure that uh, they are green poles. They're from live trees because you don't want this thing to catch fire when you are preserving your food. You're also going to want some cordage. I use quarter inch sisal, use paracord, whatever you got. And we're going to go ahead and put a tripod lash on this right now. Uh, you can do it however you want, wrapping the rope around. But if I'm going to do something out in the wilds, I might as well do it right. So check it out. Start with a clove hitch, end with a clove hitch, three wraps, two fraps. That's the idea. There we go. On to the next step. Tripod is centered. We've gone ahead and put some rocks around each of the three poles to make sure it doesn't slip. But at this time, we're going to go and put some cross members in, as well as some of the support structure for the racks. Use your green wood. Make sure that it's not going to burn. We're going to be putting these in horizontal, lashing them all the way around. That will further stabilize the tripod, as well as give a surface to drape meat over on top of or hang from. So make sure that you're not too close to the fire, too close to the heat source. You want your meats and your foods up high where just the smoke, the cooled down smoke, is wafting through them. So, that right there is where we're going to do it for this rack. You can get multiple racks if you want to after a while, but first set.
Looks to be ready, guys. Go ahead and fire this thing up in the morning. Today is our day. We've gone ahead and started to season our oven. We've got a small fire down here. We'll slowly bring that up, build our coals, and hopefully get a little bit of the moisture that's retained within this rock to evaporate before we really get going. Be very selective in the wood that you're gonna be using for smoking. Today we're using a mesquite. Uh, any of your fruit trees, well, just do your research. Find out what kind of smell, what kind of flavor you want. There's probably a tree for you. You do want to stay away from your toxic and poisonous trees and any of your sappy or resinous trees. So any of the buckeye, any of your mountain laurel, pine trees, you want to steer clear of. We'll go ahead and get this thing going, prep our fish, time to start. Today the meat that we're going to be cold smoking is shad. And shad is usually known as a bait fish, but if you're surviving, meat is meat. And these guys get pretty large if you let them eat long enough. Now they're a very thin and skinny fish. We've gone ahead and cleaned them out. We've gutted them so there's no more organs on the inside. At this point, you want to go ahead and wash any of the stuff that you're uncomfortable with putting in your mouth out of the fish because after this, there will be no more alterations. It's going to be salted and put on the smoker in just a moment. Uh, the salt that I'm going to be using today is kosher salt. And I like that because it has the least amount of additives, at least for what I can get easily. If you want to keep that pretty pink color of the flesh on the inside, uh, you can use things like pink salt, has lots of nitrates. You can even use iodine salt or table salt. It doesn't actually stick as well, but it works if you are in a pinch. But the idea is that we salt every portion that we can get to, and that will help in the drying and preserving process. So. So we've gone ahead and started to hang up our fish for the smoke and what we're using are green twigs and this is from a mesquite tree still alive. I wanted to make sure that it could still break over but not snap and that's uh, for a good reason. Now this piece is the top of a limb. So right here this is a Y. I've clipped this one short, this one long and there's a reason for that. So I'm going to bend that over just like that. I'm going to take my fish and it might be easier or harder depending on the uh, fish's mouth size but you're going to go ahead and take that bent over end and put it into the fish's mouth. And that's going to go down into the digestive tract, all the way down the throat. It's not very elegant, but it works out. And you're going to push it down there where that barb actually hooks. Okay, just like that. And that's the idea. Uh, from there, you can go ahead and uh, take it over to your dehydration rack, your cold smoking rack, and hang it wherever you need to hang it. Okay. The benefit to having these hooks is that you can pull them off, you can vary the height. If one's getting too much heat or not enough smoke, you can move them around. Works out pretty well compared to some of the other methods I've seen. Uh, we'll go ahead and do this to all the fish, hang them up, and uh, check them back every 30 minutes to add wood to it. Make sure the fire's going good. We'll forge some more stuff up and see what else we can put on here. Might as well get the most juice out of it if it's always burning. Doing a little bit of foraging down by the river, and our water's up this year. It's looking pretty good. But we've come down here to get wild onion. And uh, while I was crawling down the bank, I came across this. That's your nice little uh, water snake shed. So lots of reptiles down here, lots of life. This ragweed gives pretty good cover. But we've, what we've come for is this wild onion, and it's pretty easy to get at. It's doing really well, very healthy. Pretty soon these are gonna flower out all the way. We want to get them before they completely flower, before they get too, uh, too much further along. But we'll go ahead and dehydrate them over the uh, cold smoker, just as we're doing everything else, and that ought to preserve them for just a little bit longer. Depending on your soil type, you might actually have to go and dig these guys out. We've got a lot of sand here around the, uh, the river area. So if you're lucky and you hold your mouth right, you can go ahead and uh, just gently coax them out of the ground. And you'll have uh, 
you'll have your green onion that you pay 60 70 cents for at the supermarket and we'll get a few bundles of that uh, cooked onion gives you lots of calories caramelizes you have sugars if you cook it right and consume it but it'll keep you going get a few more we'll go check back up on our fire so I get it started a couple pounds of onions get them cleaned up and uh, put on the cold smoker Bringing those onions back, we've come across this guy, and this is a Spanish dagger yucca, and the bloom is magnificent. Now, these are usually edible, and if they get too far gone, if they've been up here too long, they start to get a bit bitter. Go ahead and give it a taste real fast. I'm sure I'm not wasting my time. These things are fantastic, though. Crisp and good to go. Well, looking at the size of it, and these each of these leaves is uh, really dense, really wide. There's no way I could eat all of that. So we're going to go ahead and cut that down. There's dozens and dozens of more of them out here on the land. And uh, we're also going to dehydrate these. So, see if I can't get to it without putting too many extra holes in it. Something more for the cooker. Alright, 10 more pounds of food. It is now the second day and the sun is setting. These fish, these vegetables have been cold smoking for almost 36 hours straight and they've come a long way. I want to go ahead and show you the progress of the shad. We're going to continue smoking throughout the night just to make sure everything is all the way done. Uh, take a look at that. It should be stiff as board, just like that. You're looking for dry, dry jerky. Uh, the smells coming from this fish there shouldn't be any, other than maybe the wood smoke that you've been using. So no rotten, no fishy smells. That's the idea. Whenever you move it, you should hear that crunching sound. That'll be the bones and the crispness of the skin. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue smoking this, as well as our onions and our yucca. And we've gone ahead and moved our onions. They're taking advantage of that heat rock. So that's slowly leaching the moisture out of them. Now when you're done with this, uh, storage needs to be in a cool, dry place. Ideally, you're going to actually pack your fish and vegetables in salt. So just alternate layers of salt, fish, salt, fish, and they ought to keep for months and months. Last minute notes, a bit of caution, concern, and advice. Now after you've stored these, understand that you must cook them. Wash off that salt, make sure that you cook them all the way through. They're not cooked, they are only preserved. Also, this demonstration that I've just undertaken is that of an old, old technique. All right, there's a reason back in the day people didn't live as long as they do now. We have new and modern techniques that work much better at inhibiting microbial growth and keeping you from getting sick. So only, only take upon this process in dire need. You want to be very, very sure of what you're doing and you want to be very cautious. But know the risks associated with performing this act. Uh, as far as this structure is concerned, I would definitely tweak it and change it around. Uh, first off, location. Make sure that you are in a sheltered area. We're out here in the open, so we are at the whims of nature itself. Anytime the wind blows, my smoke's not going to be where it needs to be. Anytime it rains, the rain is going to come down upon it. So you can either push this up against a wall, build a windscreen, do something to keep that wind from blowing and messing this up. One way around that, back in the day, was to actually take a wet piece of material, perhaps a large hide, and wrap it around this teepee structure. And what that would do is concentrate your smoke and make sure that it funneled exactly where you need it to go. Worked out pretty well. But all in all, guys, have fun out in nature. Like and subscribe, and as always, till next time.